welcome to How to Go Independent. Today, we will address one of the biggest questions about setting up your own practice. And that is, what will my payout be? In other words, what is my true net after all the stuff I have to pay for? So it's something that I feel uh, I've done a lot of homework on and talked to a lot of people about. So I'm excited to get into it. Um, and you'll hear this uh, monologue from me here in a, in a moment. The short answer is, of course, it depends, which is the, the frustrating answer for a lot of things. Like when clients ask you, what does what do things cost? What will my return be? Um, so the answer is it depends. However, I think this this episode should give you a great framework to estimate using your own numbers. Um, and uh, I think I hopefully you'll find it useful. It will cover some of the main um, parts that, that will factor in your payout, such as uh, what what does the firm take? However, you're affiliated with either an RIA or an independent broker dealer. Uh, you know what will your your top line gross payout be? Whatever costs of doing business that 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 entails, uh, both both your gross payout and any any fees and expenses you'll incur from them. Your st any staffing costs, any office or uh, occupancy costs, rent rent etc any health insurance, any tax implications of, of being self-employed, and a couple other miscellaneous categories or at least issues to think about. So, you know, that will cover probably 90% of the the issue of, and the question of what, would you, what will you net if you're on your own. Um, a couple other comments. The audio quality of this might not be as good as I hope it will be in future episodes. Uh, that's because when I recorded this monologue, my intent with it was to have it transcribed, which which I did, and it's now on our website, howtogoindependent.com, but I hadn't thought of the idea of using it in a podcast format, so I think it, it is good enough to listen to, and it shouldn't be an issue, but I just want to mention that as future episodes, uh, you'll notice we'll have higher audio quality. So it's, we'll get into it in just a second. I would do, do uh, ask you to stick around. I, I'd ask for some input after the fact, uh, after the monologue, get your input and feedback. But here we go. What will my payout be if I go independent? That is the million dollar question or sometimes more over a lifetime. Obviously, payout is a big factor in our business and a, a number that we think we all know at uh, when we're employees at a big firm. But um, when you're independent, it's a lot more moving parts, a lot more complicated. And I think a lot of the misconceptions about that and the, the nature of thinking it's too good to be true are one reason that you might not have explored independence or learned more in the past. So I want to go through uh, at a fairly high level, but 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 accurate, uh, kind of the set of factors that will determine what you might net if you were to take your existing practice and basically do the same thing on an independent an independent model. So let's uh, let's go. What I'll try to do is discuss each factor, and I'll talk obviously pretty broadly because, as you know, each situation is different. And in particular, if you're independent, you have a lot more control of these variables, which is something I'll, I'll discuss as I as I touch on each one. Uh, and and the, I'll probably do a separate discussion of why that control is so valuable. But uh, today we'll just talk about the numbers. Depending on the firm you decide to use and how you structure yourself, the top line gross payout um, can vary fairly widely. But in general, if you're in a true independent model, you should be looking to gross uh, at least 80 to 90 percent. Now that's assuming you have a, a somewhat viable business. Let's say you're doing at least 150 to 200 thousand of gross revenue, or you will at your at your independent model. Uh, certainly, the numbers, the, the fixed costs are a lot bigger issue if you're uh, you know, below those levels. But there's some minimum minimally viable level where these numbers make sense. So. Uh, I'll talk, I'll probably talk more about the three to three hundred fifty thousand dollar production level, which tends to be in in a lot of the employee firms, uh, where you can make at least a reasonable living. However, depending on what firm you're at, that might not be looked 
favorably upon, and you may be treated like a second-class citizen. So that's kind of why I focus there. The numbers get more attractive as you go up the scale. So if you're doing a million and a half in production, the numbers are insanely uh, beneficial. Uh, and if you're doing a lot less, then the, the fixed cost might be an issue. But we'll kind of focus in that, what I would call that mid-range. So let's assume 85%. That's very reasonable from, from uh, my experience, observation, both as an advisor and, and also supporting other advisors and pricing that sort of situation in our network. So let's assume an 85% top-line gross payout. And one of the big things that the detractors of independence will point out, and accurately, I might add, is that you don't really net 85% which is sort of obvious, um, and uh, that's like saying if you make a million dollars of gross income, you don't take home a million because you have to pay taxes. Uh, no kidding. But So w the point is you get 85% of your revenue to start with, and then you have to figure out what you have to pay for, what comes out of that, and that's kind of what I hope to help explain in this discussion. Uh, the two biggest expenses for m almost all of us, in uh, or potentially big biggest expenses, are our staff uh, or or virtual help, any kind of assistance, staff help, and an office, office space, occupancy costs uh, of a, of any kind. Uh, the one of the beautiful things about having an independent practice is you have almost complete control of those two variables. So your biggest uh, expenses. Are, are ones you can control directly. So I am I know plenty of people that the, the expense of those two line items is zero or effectively zero uh, for the for the office or the occupancy cost. They might deduct a home office and uh, the prorated cost of that on their taxes, but, but compared to, you know, cash out of pocket, it's essentially zero. And they do their own um, administrative work, and that's their decision. Uh, depending on who you talk to, that may or may not be the best decision, but there are plenty of people that are are happy to kind of do their own uh, administrative work and not have to outlay any cash uh, to keep their practice going. So you can also, on the, on the flip side, you can spend as much or as little as you'd like on staff or office space. So if you want to, if you have a three hundred and twenty-seven thousand dollar production, uh, you can hire six assistants if you like. You can hire three, you can hire two, and you can pay him or her whatever you like. So you could you could go way outside these ranges that I'll discuss, but um, this is kind of, I think, the what I'm shooting for is the amount of uh, outlay that you probably need or most of us would need to keep the practice uh, growing without us being bogged down too much, um, but not someone who's trying to grow at a... Uh, super rapid pay th through through a uh, labor intensive marketing campaign. So this is sort of your run of the mill practice. I would estimate a good rule of thumb for um, staff is probably somewhere between five and ten percent of your gross revenue. So if you look around your office at a, at an employee firm, um, for every million dollars of production, the firm might be spending seven or eight percent, uh, maybe a little bit more if you, if you factor in the employee costs. So I think 10% is on the high end. 5% uh, would be if you if you're doing let's say $320,000, that equates to about 16,000 a year. That could easily get you a shared assistant with with somebody you know and trust, another advisor, or um, virtual assistants that that are out there. Uh, you could get I think more than enough help to sustain a, a, a business of that level. And again, I'm also assuming that we don't have a overly labor-intensive business, uh, you don't have a, a, a niche that requires tons and tons of paperwork on an ongoing basis. Um, you might have some transactional business, but it doesn't require a lot of administrative activity all the time. Um, so I think 5 to 10 percent is a good rule of thumb. Again, uh, results may vary, and that is largely driven by what you want to accomplish, which again is one of the primary benefits I see and have in my own practice is I get to make that call for what I think fits me best, and I can change that uh, decision at any time I want. So the next item would be the office or occupancy cost. Uh, for that, I would use a 5% rule of thumb. In other words, if let's use my 325 or 320 
production. Again, sixteen thousand a year. You can get a in most parts of the the country a decent office. Uh, for if you're a solo with no assistant, certainly that's probably you probably don't need to even spend that much. Uh, if you have multiple staff people and you really want to dress up your your um, your image, you might spend a little more than that. But again, I think that that will vary. But a five percent of gross would be you know a good a good rule of thumb. And again, these numbers will vary, but they're not likely to be way off unless you're doing something fairly outside of what I would call typical and sort of in the the main part of the the eighty percent of us the way we do things. So those are the two main costs, uh, 5 to 10 percent for staff, if you have any, and uh, office space, we'll, we'll say 5 percent. Um, the only other main categories of expenses that I would, you know, I'm trying to simplify here, so uh, as we get into the operational costs, uh, you'll have to add in things if you think they're essential to your business that I haven't discussed. Uh, the next one that a lot of people ask about is, how much, how much am I going to pay for health insurance? Uh, there's good news and bad news on this front. The good news is health insurance is exp uh, the bad news is health insurance is expensive. The good news is you're probably already paying uh, and realizing that uh, where you are now. Uh, most firms that I, that I'm aware of for for advisors, they are not subsidizing it dramatically, mostly because they know we can make the kind of income that should not be a deal breaker. So if we're paying a thousand dollars a month for our health insurance at an employee firm. Uh, that is, you know, it's a lot of money, especially for the average person, the average family. However, you know, at the, at the kind of income that we're able to potentially generate, it, it's, not, it's not something that should stop us from being in this business, whether we're an employee or, or independent. So, again, each situation is different, but when I've examined the details of large company uh, benefit plans, there's a marginal cost, but it's not as high as you think. So um, we can, you can kind of investigate that if, you, if you're looking uh, into the details and are getting close to making a decision about uh, a business model change. But just keep in mind, it's probably going to be when you equate it to pay out a small percentage. So in other words, even if you spent $1,000 a month more than you're spending now, which for most of us I find doesn't happen, but let's say it's it's $1,000 a month extra. Well, if that's, on again, on a $300,000 practice, that's a 4% payout issue. So it's important, but it's not massive. Um, and that's, again, when you start to think about these things in terms of the, the gross payout differential that you start from, 30, 35, 40, 50%, depending on the situation, you know, you're going to give some of that back when you pay for staff and your business expenses, including health insurance, but you're certainly not going to give all, all of it back or even close. So something to keep in mind, and again, that's a comp complex issue, but don't let that scare you away from exploring uh, your options if, if you're inclined to. Now, again, there might be times when that is a deal breaker and it just doesn't make sense to make a change. Um, but there are also independent um, model uh, firms and platforms that will account for that. You know, you might have a little bit lower payout, but there's a group insurance plan that you can plug into. And if you talk to a good recruiter or the firms themselves or uh, someone like me or us, we can probably help you find that if, if, uh, if necessary. Another big expense that uh, if the detractors of the independent model might focus on is that you have to pay self-employment taxes, which is a very good point. Um, basically, Social Security and Medicare taxes together are 7.65% of your net income. However, there is, as you should know, a cap on the Social Security part of that. So it caps out uh, around, you know, somewhere around $120,000 or a little less a year. So, you know, that, that amount is kind of capped and fixed. So the, the Medicare piece continues to go up, but that's only one point four or five percent on each side. And one thing to keep in mind that I think people miss or don't think through is you're, you're going to pay um, both sides of those uh, employment taxes as, as a self-employed person, but you're already paying one side of them right now. As an employee, you pay Social Security and Medicare taxes regardless. So it's a, you may have say 15.3% self-employment tax. That's, oh my gosh, that's a ton. Well, no, actually, it's half of that because you're already paying, you're already paying that. And again, the the cap on the Social Security tax makes that a fairly fixed number. So, whatever the, this year's Social Security tax maximum is, 
you multiply that by 6.2%, and then you add 1.45% of the, your total net, and there's sort of your the uh, the overhead, the extra overhead, so to speak, of being independent versus being an employee. As an example, if you're netting $100,000, uh, that's you know $7,650 extra in employment taxes. You haven't hit the cap yet on the Social Security side. To net a hundred, uh, you're probably going to be grossing somewhere around one hundred and seventy thousand. So that works out to about a five percent payout differential, and that's at the high end. Uh, if you're grossing, <coughs> I'm sorry, if you're netting a lot more, uh, when you hit that when you hit that um, that dollar cap on the Social Security taxes, that becomes a lower and lower percentage. So again, if you're netting, and again your net will be a lot higher when you're independent. So uh, when you start to net 200, 250, and, and up, again the, the percentage as a, compared to, as a payout issue is, is going to go is going to start to go down if that makes sense. So hopefully that explains that it, it's an issue, but again you have to kind of frame it in, in the way that makes you take into account the logic and look at what you're doing now, not just the 15.3 percent that will scare people away. Sometimes it's not compared to zero; it's compared to half of that. Uh, the other main issue, the other main expenses that I would say you have to consider are what I call cost of doing business. So that's your broker dealer or, and or RIA, licensing fees, technology fees, affiliation fees, miscellaneous stuff that you have to uh, errors and omissions. Uh, that's a big, fairly big cost uh, as a, in this in this grouping. And then you have you know your general operating expenses, uh, your phone system, your Paper, your toner, your computer stuff, um, lic you know, licensing and fees uh, that you usually incur as an independent. Again, there's a lot of stuff that that's, that you have to pay for, but it doesn't add up, uh, again, on a percentage basis, usually to a tremendous amount of money. Um, I'll address here most of the things I think we would all need to, to get in business and do business and not, um, not any marketing uh, or... Um, if someone wants a full suite of very complex financial planning software, you have to price that in, you know on its own. But I think a good round number, if you're a again in that three to four hundred thousand dollar production range, let's say, and you kind of have you have some tools, but you don't have anything outrageously expensive. Um, so I'm, I'm not, not that I'm saying this doesn't include any salt planning software or any um, subscriptions to research, but this is sort of the a baseline. I think you can probably operate your practice pretty well on about twenty thousand dollars a year, and here I use a, a dollar amount instead of a percentage because, um, again, one of the beautiful things about the an independent model is your costs do do not go up. You don't pay for more re, pay more for research just because your production goes up. So if I'm producing three hundred and uh, a few years later I'm up to six hundred thousand, uh, if I'm in an employee firm, guess what? I am now paying twice as much for my staff, twice as much for rent, twice as much for research, twice as much for financial planning software because I, I'm basically paying more for everything because there is no, there are no fixed costs or very little. Um, whereas in an independent model, it's like a real business where you have some, some overhead that you have, to, you have to pay for, but once you've covered it, uh, any revenue beyond that is, is going to be paid at your marginal Payout. So, in other words, if I'm doing 325 <clears throat> and I've covered all my fixed expenses, and, and for the next fifty thousand dollars of revenue, let's say, I don't have any real new expenses that come up. Um, maybe a slight amount of labor to service that extra fifty thousand of revenue. That fifty thousand of revenue is is going to essentially be paid out at my my marginal payout. So, at that eighty five percent top line number because I've already covered my fixed costs. So that's where this analysis of, of a payout, it's very hard to do because it starts to go in your favor as you grow. Um, and, and to some degree, the same is also true. You, if, if your revenue shrinks, your payout is going to go down because it's coming off that marginal revenue. But again, you can also control your costs a lot more. And uh, in, in a worst case scenario, you can divest of staff and office and uh, software. If if you you know go into if you need to go into your shell for some reason, if we have a 2008 2009 and you've gotten a little bit ahead of the uh, curve on investment, you can pull that back. Um, so 
anyways, that's a point I want to make that the, the marginal payout is not what you really net, but at the margin, when you have extra revenue, it you know if you get ten thousand dollars of commission or fees, you get eighty five hundred bucks in this scenario to your bottom line. So that's a real number at the margin. So so that that's that's kind of a high level overview. Um, I'll I'll write a post with it has the this kind of laid out in in writing as well. I know it's hard to sometimes visualize via audio, but bottom line is it is very difficult to envision a scenario in that production level. Again, say it's 250 to f and, and above, where you're not netting at least 15 to 20 percent a year more in terms of payout. So again, if if um, I think a good rule of thumb, if you're running a f reasonably efficient practice, but you you are investing some in staff, even if it's shared or part time, and um, in an office, I, I think 65 percent is a reasonable target, uh, given all those factors. Again, it could be a little less depending on how you set things up. Could be more if you if you use technology efficiently and don't need staff or don't don't need much staff, or if you have a um, you know, a virtual office solution or or home office solution that could be as high as seventy percent. But bottom line is, conservatively speaking, I think I've I've used that fifteen to twenty percent number uh, when you go through all these details and the nitty gritty. And I think before you make a move, you certainly want to investigate these the details more than I've outlined here. Outlined here, you want to see those. What are those miscellaneous costs? Show me them. What do they look like? What are the gotchas? And I think any any firm that you're talking to, or recruiter, or firm, uh, you know, if you have friends and trusted associates, they can help you, you know, run that run those details at, at any particular firm or arrangement on, within a given platform. But here's here's the way I look at that. Uh, sometimes that 15%, let's say, doesn't sound like it's worth enough to move. Uh, but again. Let me reframe that a little bit or, or give you some thoughts. So at the employee firm, when I say 15% better uh, when you're to be independent, I'm, I'm including, also I'm adding back in the value of any deferred comp, you know, 3 to 5% a year, maybe more if you're at the, the higher production spectrum, end of the spectrum. Um, but then again, these economics work a lot more in your favor. So I'm kind of focused in that middle where you might get some deferred comp, but it's not likely to be, a huge percentage of your of your gross, so you know maybe that's three to five percent, um, and again that's usually of your net. Uh, maybe there's a four hundred one k match. Again, you can do the math. You just have to sit down and do it. You know, yes, it's nice to have all these little add-ons, but what are they really worth? Add add, add up the value of them. If if you're contributing eight thousand dollars a year, and you're getting matched on half of that, that's great. That's four thousand dollars a year free, so to speak. But if you're grossing four hundred thousand dollars of production, that's only one percent of your gross. It's a one percent payout improvement, and I think sometimes uh, behavioral finance would tell us that we get more excited about this fifty percent match on our eight thousand dollars. But if someone said, "Oh, we're going to give you a one percent payout bump," I'm not sure anyone would really care. So you got to frame that. Uh, you know, firms are going to frame things to their benefit. They're going to say, "We're we're paying you five ways." Uh, but you got to really add up those up and figure out, you know, what does it really add up to? Because there's one thing I can just about guarantee: the the revenue that you're getting paid, it, it's not five different ways. It's coming from, it's coming from one source, and that's the revenue your practice generates. So you can take that one, uh, I think, pretty much on faith. So again, add, you can add in limited partnership, tax, um, you know, bonuses, any trips that are paid for. Um, you, any kind of revenue, I think if you add it in and do really a hard analysis, I think that 15% incre increase in payout is a, is a very good low-end estimate. So let's say you're, let's say I'm 40. Let's say you're 40 years old and you, you, you're going you're gonna to do this for uh, 20 more years. Or let's say you're 50 and you're going to do this for 20 more years. Whatever the case may be, I'm using 20 years because it's a long time, but it gives plenty of us um, enough time to do it for 20 years without being a, an age that's unreasonable to think we we might be doing this. So if you if you're grossing 300,000 even and you have a 15% payout improvement, uh, by my math, 15% of 300 is 45,000 dollars a year improvement, which is pretty dang good in my mind. Again, depending on your situation, that could be sort of the difference between saving 5,000 a year and saving 50,000 a year for retirement. Or you know, take take the 
the 45 marginal and, and enjoy 15 of it and save 30 or save half of it, Wh whatever whatever fits for your situation. But bottom line is it's it's a nice difference on a on a year by year basis. But that's not even in my mind the most valuable aspect of it. If you do, you know, in our business, you should be able to run some sort of future value calculation. So if you if for if for 20 years you take that 45,000 a year, let's say you could earn 5% a year on it for 20 years. That's around one and a half million dollars of value that you've created. So one and a half million dollars of value um, for making for basically doing the same business with a reasonable production level. Again, these numbers scale up. So if you're doing nine hundred thousand, that's four point five million dollar difference over those twenty years. And that does not that does not factor in the value of your practice at the end of that time or whenever you sell your practice, if you sell it. Um, which is, I don't care what goes on, it's almost, it's almost impossible to fathom a, a point where an employee firm would pay you as much or anywhere close to what you can get for your practice um, on the open market as an independent. Now certainly the, the employee firms, wirehouses are starting to realize they need to do something to you know, keep you in your seat um, and make it, make it just good enough so you don't leave. But I, I tend to think they're never going to do anything more than the absolute minimum to get to get people to stick around. So um, and I'll go into some, there's some other discussions I've done about the inherent flexibility when you get to that point of how you can step back from your practice. You don't have to just sell it outright. And, and again, all those options, almost all of them are, are hard to replicate in the in employee world. Or if, they're, if you can, they're a lot, it's a lot more difficult, a lot more red tape. So that's kind of the overall scenario I look at. Um, I look at these numbers backwards and forwards for several years. I tried to factor in growth. I tried to factor in what if I just kind of cash cow it. I don't want to grow at all. If I want a, more of a, a quote-unquote lifestyle practice where I just take care of my existing clients, take a few referrals. Because um, I wasn't sure when I went independent, I really wasn't sure which way I wanted to go. If I wanted to try and grow aggressively or if I would just want to kind of enjoy, you know, a fairly low stress life and uh, just take care of my existing clients. I've kind of done something in between which I can talk about separately but basically my my practice has grown nice and steadily and I've but I've had the time and energy and flexibility to create you know another whole a whole other business and then this uh, this venture is sort of a, another business or could be on its own so again uh, that's more to the benefits of flexibility and control but Bottom line is the payout itself is is is, is can be life changing. And again, the fifteen percent is low. That can go to twenty twenty five percent depending on your situation. And then as you grow, the the economics get even I think better. So um, hope that helps. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. And and I hope this was useful. And there you have it. My rundown on how to estimate what your net payout might be if you were to go independent. Um, I'd like your feedback though, uh, whether you're in a wirehouse, a uh, quote unquote regional firm, uh, a large insurance based broker dealer, or if you're already independent, uh, let me know what, what do you think your payout is or how have you calculated it? Um, because I think one of the key things that we have to do here is try to compare apples to apples. So if you're in a wirehouse or Edward Jones or the insurance companies, um, add it all up. What's your, your your nominal payout plus bonuses, whether that's branch profitability or otherwise, deferred compensation, 401k match, uh, you know other other things that are covered for you. If you have an expense account, uh, limited partnership income, any incentive trips, uh, the value of a, a traditional pension, which I know when I was at Morgan Stanley, I always calculated that in. Because if I stayed long enough, I was, um, I don't think I'd be covered now if I started there. But when I got there in 2005, I was still covered by their traditional pension. And I, I assessed some present value or future value of that, that benefit. And it was substantial if I'd stayed there the rest of my career. So when I did all these analyses for myself, I certainly included those because I didn't want to be short-sighted. Because, you know, the value of a 401k match isn't a lot in my pocket today, but, but over time... Obviously, that's real money in your retirement plans that you need to consider. Same thing for a pension. So 
I don't want to minimize those things, but I find when I add it all up, there's still at least 15 to 20 percent um, difference. So when you look at that, it's uh, pretty exciting. That's why I've started this project, and I'm happy to, to share my experience and, and an input. But I want to hear yours. So um, either send me an email, post to the comments, leave a review. What do you think your payout is? And, and um, is there any other questions that you have? So be happy to try and answer them either either in the comments or in another episode. Hope that help was helpful. And tune in for our next episode of How to Go Independent.